Hello, I'm John Molesky, and this is Wilson Center Now, a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. My guest today is Elizabeth Newberry. Liz is director of the Wilson Center's Serious Games Initiative, part of the Center's Science, Technology, and Innovation Program. And she's here to talk about, guess what, Serious Games. What else? Hi, Liz. Welcome. Thanks for joining Hi, us. Hi, thank you so much for having me. So, you know, I joke about the title uh, of Serious Games that, uh, that what else are we going to talk about? But I'm, I'm assuming that some of our viewers are not familiar with the terminology. So tell us what it is we're talking about. And then it suggests there's something we're not talking about on serious games. Uh, ground us in, in what it means. Yes. Uh, so serious games was actually originally coined in the digital age by the Wilson Center many ages ago, uh, before my time here, around uh, 10 years ago, because there was a general movement of wanting to use games not just for entertainment purposes, but for positive impacts. And that can come in a couple of different dimensions. One of the ways that you'll often see this is in education. So game-based learning or using games as a tool for education in a positive light is one of the ways that we use the term serious games. And, and in the copy on the homepage for your Serious Games initiative, it says the world's most dynamic medium. And the Wilson Center is not exactly used to doing hyperbole. So I guess this means something more significant than that. What, is, what does that claim mean? So one of the reasons why people have been using games for education and other purposes that are supposed to enact positive social change is because they're an interactive medium. So dynamic in the way of interactive, as opposed to when I'm reading a policy brief, much as I love my colleagues' policy briefs, <laughs> they, they're not as interactive as a game is. And there's a certain component of that interactivity that provides people with a lot of what we call agency over their own story and over their own learning experience. There's a lot of research that suggests by providing that sort of interactivity, that ownership over the experience, people actually will learn and retain information a little bit better. Is, do people associate games with younger people? Is, is the effectiveness of serious games limited to a certain demographic? So actually not. Um, one of the ways that the Wilson Center originally cut their teeth, if you will, on serious games is through our uh, series on, of all topics, the, the federal budget. So I, I like to joke that only in DC would we go, you know what would be really fun <laughs> is the federal budget. Um, and the original uh, game there, Budget Hero, hit a sort of multi-ray of demographics. They did hit the middle school students who are being assigned the game by their teachers and educators within the classroom. But a large majority of our users are actually 65 and older for that game. And it continues to today where we have the fiscal shift still about the federal budget, which we developed in partnership with the Brookings Institute. And that game hits the middle school audience, but also a large demographic of 35 and older adults who are playing these games to get a better grasp of what are the budget policies that are out there? What are the different ways that we're talking about the budget and what their impact is on the national debt? You know, you may have just made history, Liz, when you spoke the words, you know, what would be really fun, the federal budget, uh, th those words may have never been strung together in the same, same way. But tell us about the feedback uh, to that game, the original budget hero, now fiscal ship, uh, members of Congress were interested in it. Yeah, it's one of the few games that I can take to Congress, and then I can also take to classrooms and almost everybody enjoys it for different reasons. Um, so with the, the budget series, one of the ways that we designed that particular game was so it was accessible for a wide range of audiences, but it really tries to illustrate and really tries to bring home that it's a nonpartisan issue of bringing down the national debt. Fiscal responsibility goes across different, uh, all sidelines really of Congress. So I have played it from everywhere from congressional offices and showed the game as a tool for their constituents. I've also uh, hold, held on uh, demo events where we put uh, congressional staff in competition with one another to try to see who can, with certain goals set, uh, manage to get our debt down quickly. And then the other side of it is I've played it with classrooms. So really you hit a long range of different audiences and it's a tool that can be really flexible depending on how it's used. 
my own experience having played the game is it's a humbling experience because you realize just how complicated it is to set priorities, fund them, and come up with something that is close to a balanced budget. Yeah, but I want to hit on what you just said is that it's a complex issue. And one of the reasons why a lot of people look to games for these sort of educational processes is to lower that barrier of entry, to make something that's really complicated that you wouldn't want to normally engage with and really making it accessible. So I also don't know, normally go, you know, it would make a really great Sunday afternoon. Let me read through 500 pages of policy briefs on the federal budget. But by playing the game, I can get a little bit of my toe in the water for understanding what I'm hearing on the news, what I'm trying to engage with um, in, in my like friends group. Like I don't understand what these terms mean. And just giving me a little bit more of the tools that I can go then to learn a little bit more after the game. One of the reasons why we designed the fiscal ship and the budget hero series is so that hopefully after playing the game, people will feel a little bit more empowered and a little bit more confident in their understanding of the federal budget. You, uh, you know, a favorite quote of mine, and I can paraphrase it from Albert Einstein is essentially make everything as simple as possible but not too simple. And I'm wondering how you think about that as someone who is involved in designing these games. You want to make it accessible. You want to take something complicated and make it simple, but you don't want to distort it through oversimplification. How do you think about that? So there's a couple of ways that we think about that very critically as we're designing games. And I'll give a, a, an example. We're currently in the process of developing a game called the Plastic Pipeline, which is about ocean plastics. Again, uh, very light topics that we cover in our games, very uh, very fun topics of, uh, that we try to tackle, but critical policy issues. And one of the things that we're currently working on is a lot of the content and the information that's going into the game. I'm working very closely with my colleague, Jennifer Turner at the China Environment Forum here at the Wilson Center. And one of the things that we are moving through this process and developing this game is we're not just going to the research ourselves, but we're also peer reviewing, if you will, a lot of the content. So we're bringing in experts from across different industries and saying, this is how we're thinking about talking about it. Does this make sense? Is this too simple? Is there anything that we need to bring into the conversation? And just being very cognizant that this is a tool that's an entry level, but you also don't wanna make it too easy for people as they're engaging with it, too simple, as you said. And one of the ways we do that is engaging with experts in the field. One of the ways we do that is by engaging with research. And another way that we do this is by testing it throughout the process. There's a lot that happens behind the scenes of making any sort of a game at the Wilson Center. And a lot of that comes back down to testing and making sure that we're engaging with people throughout the process. I'm going to make a guess about uh, the educational context for, for use of serious games in that there might be a student who doesn't respond to the traditional way of teaching, but that this works for them. Is that the case? Is there a type of student where this is a breakthrough? Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons why a lot of people have looked to game-based learning and serious games as an approach to education is because of the impact that games can have. So one of the most well-researched side of it, especially in civic education games, is how we can use games and how we can leverage them for motivation. So thinking about those kids who would not normally be engaged in a classroom experience or those adults who may not normally want to dive into a 25-page policy brief. Again, nothing against 25-page policy briefs. But thinking about those people who need a different type of learning or a different tool to get them to be motivated. And that is one of the reasons why we use serious games at the, the Wilson Center. One of the games that we developed also with the City of Sao Paulo and the Brava Foundation with our Brazil Institute, uh, Cities in Play. It also has a Portuguese title, which please forgive me for not mangling here on the, the, the channel. But one of the things that we noticed is that after playing that game, 67% of students were more engaged with the concept of being wanting to go into a political career. The, the game challenges them to be mayor for a day uh, or a shorter window than that actually. And one of the things that they will do after playing the game is feel like they can be more engaged in public policy, more engaged in the public sphere. And that's this one of the reasons why they, they go towards games. 
is this is this a growth industry? In, in other words, are people catching on that this can be an effective tool and we're seeing more activity? And then the, the makers of entertainment type games, the leaders in the gaming industry, are they buying in? Yeah, so that's a really good question. I'm going to break it down a little bit discreetly. So for your growth industry, yes, games are definitely a rapidly growing economic uh, industry. One of the ways that we're seeing that that we've been researching a little bit here at the Wilson Center is through the concept of esports which is competitive video gaming. It's not uh, just Madden or the sports titles, but it's people playing video games as a competition. And that is a rapidly growing industry, partially because of the pandemic when we didn't have a lot of access to traditional sports, a lot of colleges in particular moved towards using esports or computer-based sports activities to help it keep their students engaged. We also see the military using esports more and more to keep their servicemen engaged and creating even informal leagues across the, the industry. So there is a rapid growth here on that side. Um, it's projected to be a multi-million dollar industry or billion dollar industry. I have to check my numbers there. But one of the things that we see is a growth in that area. The second side of it that you were talking about is really how we understand what a serious game is in a game-based approach. There are largely two traditional ways that we can classify a serious game. And this goes back to Penn Sawyer's original definition. The first is a game like we make here at the Wilson Center that's designed from its inception to be an educational game. Fiscal ship, um, uh, plastic, the plastic pipeline, all of these games we developed with the intention of having learning outcomes. The second way that we've actually seen, and this is very much in the wheelhouse of a lot of educators, is using commercial games within the classroom for an educational context. If you think about it, Shakespeare wasn't originally designed to be educational, but English teachers have been for centuries using it as part of their educational curriculum. Very similarly, uh, educators will use games, Minecraft is a very common example, for educational outcomes. We're seeing a third category though also emerging over the past couple of years, and that is games designed for entertainment that also have then attached to it an educational component. So Minecraft, which I just picked on a second ago, has a Minecraft education edition that they developed later on after publishing the first game. And the other that you'll see uh, as a common example are, uh, is uh, actually Assassin's Creed. They developed, they worked with historians to really create this series of discovery tours, which can be used within the classroom to sort of immerse students who might be already familiar with playing the game with the history that also is behind the game. And it's, again, not limited to classrooms. It can be all sorts of educational experiences, but we're seeing those three ways of really operationalizing educational games. Yeah, I, I love the analogy to Shakespeare. I never thought of it that way. And that certainly breaks down barriers in how you think about what the possibilities are. Uh, I want to ask you about two recent events you did and, and tell our viewers that these are archived on the Wilson Center website. So even though they're in the past tense, as far as live events, you can watch them. And they're two terrific events. And you can find them in two ways. One is we're, we'll put it in the metadata underneath this video. If you're watching this episode of Wilson Center now on the Wilson Center website, and if you're not, if you just come to wilsoncenter.org and you click under past events, you'll be able to find them. But Liz, tell us about them. Uh, the, the first involves the Federal Games Guild, which I guess you'll have to tell us first what that is, and then tell us about the event that marked its 10th anniversary. Yeah, so the Federal Games Guild is an informal community of practice that I lead across the federal agencies and entities. So Members might include the Wilson Center, the Smithsonian, and the Kennedy Center, which are our federal instrumentalities. But also we have a uh, Department of Education, NIH, um, National Institutes for Health, sorry, and then also uh, NASA and a couple of other of our alphabet soup friends across the, the agencies. This is a group that's come together largely under the onus that games can be used for good and they can be used to meet federal mission goals. So the ways that different people orient to that depends on what their particular task is. A lot of my colleagues at the Department of Education, which recently had the Ed Games Expo, which this event was part of, that they um, often fund 
educational games and educational technologies as part of their mission goals, supporting the infrastructure and small businesses that way. Others of us might research games, so the, the Wilson Center and our esports portfolio, um, and also our just general games portfolio. And a, lot, a smaller minority of us also develop games in-house or with constituents uh, to try to help mission goals. One of my colleagues at the Smithsonian Science Education Center, for example, they've been developing a lot of games that are mapped to the UN sustainability goals, really trying to make those come to life for kids around the world. And the Not other event, oh, I'm sorry, sorry please. I, I, was gonna, I was gonna just explain really quickly that the event was 10 years of that. So it was originally developed, uh, the whole coming together of federal agencies came out of the Obama White House originally, the uh, White House OSTP. And one of the things that we've uh, discovered that there's been a lot of changes through the years with those opportunities. There's more opportunities, for example, for funding for game-based initiatives. Uh, and that you can actually find on the Federal Games Guild website, which is also on the Wilson Center website. So wilsoncenter.org backslash Federal Games Guild. And you can find those uh, opportunities there. Great, thank you. I, I, when I started stepping on your words, I was gonna ask you about this next event. You earlier mentioned esports and this involved esports and historically black colleges and universities. Uh, uh, not the typical Wilson event. No, uh, certainly not, but I think it still fits very well with the Wilson Center's goals of trying to elevate global concerns around diversity and inclusion and really trying to amplify policy concerns that impact us all. So a lot of our recent work, my background before coming to the Wilson Center actually is, uh, I was an esports researcher, I was a graduate student at Cornell University, and that's what I wrote my dissertation on. So it's come back full circle where people have realized that esports is very much on the present at the moment, a billion dollar industry and projections to really skyrocket from here on out. The, that particular event, esports and education is actually take two of an event that we had last year, which focused on the more macro level as well as uh, how colleges are orienting towards esports. So we had a panel that focused on what is esports, particularly from a business or from an economics perspective. We had the local DC Overwatch team, for example, there as well as some small business owners. And then we also had a second panel that was about academics and education and colleges orientation to making space for esports. This event this year, esports and education, how HBC HBCUs are leveling the field. This came out of a really desire to amplify a lot of key themes that are coming out of HBCUs specifically and how they are incorporating uh, esports into their campus practices. We're seeing a really uh, interesting growth of academics um, towards esports. So universities and colleges providing actual accreditation or a degree in some form of esports, whether that's management of a team, thinking again in the sports metaphor, these are teams of students coming together to play against each other. They need somebody to help manage them. Uh, also borrowing a little bit from sports uh, culture, there's communication, which John, I know that you'll feel very strongly about uh, the sports communication of esports. And then another component of it that we're also seeing is more of a business end or also even connecting it to STEM education. It's a computer-based field. There's a lot of interest in how we can integrate STEM or STEAM, so science, technology, uh, science, technology, engineer, engineering, and math, or science, technology, engineering, art, and math, um, really trying to connect those to esports as a overall part of the educational curriculum. The other trend that we're seeing on these HBCU campuses is really just physically making the space and thinking about how to make the space for students to participate in esports. A lot of these a little bit suspended because we've been in a pandemic uh, and not too many students on campus necessarily. But thinking about those concerns of how we actually make the physical spaces to do these sort of high end computer um, activities. And what's interesting is that from one of the things we learned from this event is the way that they're orienting and they're making the spaces on campus really facilitates other sorts of educational outcomes. 
it's a computer lab ostentatiously for any uh, any other sh way you sh shake a stick at it when we're talking about esports arenas because there's so many really high end computers it's a multi use space potentially for students so that's really tied back to a lot of education and interest and how do we increase interest in not just colleges a lot of these are pipeline issues so trying to think of how we can get students before they come to college excited about going to college through esports but also how do we make for a stronger community of play and a stronger community when they're on campus you know i i mentioned this to you off the air and i'll mention it to our viewers now uh when i spoke to some of our colleagues about that event they were using words that they don't typically use inspiring refreshing you know they they informative is something that's part of most wilson center events but in this case it was really a different reaction so i'd encourage people who are interested to 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 find that event and watch it and congratulations to you on on organizing it uh, for a final thought for people who are interested and want to learn more uh, what kind of resources are available to them at, at the serious games initiative so one of the resources I already mentioned was the federal funding opportunities for if you're a game designer or an educator interested in that space, there's a lot of opportunities out there from across the federal government that we host here at the Wilson Center. Um, it's nothing fancy, it's a PDF, but it's still more than um, you might find elsewhere. A couple of the other resources that we offer are Games Roundups, which is a blog series I developed largely to help showcase different themes in the broader ecosystem of serious games that could be useful for either educators or policymakers looking to dive in a little bit more. One of our more popular blog posts out of that series was a games roundup on quantum computing. But I've also highlighted a couple of different um, diversity and inclusion uh, concerns recently. So uh, Black History Month or Native American History Month blog posts that can be really useful for that. And just trying to look at the broader um, possibilities of how people are using games to have very critical discussions that are helpfully informing uh, public policy. Well, Liz, thank you. Uh, and, and I should mention, they can also play the fiscal ship or, or the oh, uh, yes. fiscal ship. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, run up your own deficit. Be just like a member of Congress. Have feel the power. Now, thank you for joining us today. And thanks for all your outstanding work on, on this uh, and really exciting project. Thank you so much. And to our viewers, hope you enjoyed this edition of Wilson Center Now and that you'll join us again soon on. Till then, for all of us at the center, thanks for joining us.